Good evening and welcome to St. Peter's Church. For those of you gathered here, very warm welcome to you. For those of you gathering with us from your homes, we're glad you're with us this evening as well. We're gathered here in the church's living room. Uh, it's an interesting name for this room as this corporate redevelopment happened of this neighborhood. The community in the 1970s was really worried that uh, this church would take on a very sort of corporate nature. So they're very intentional about calling this a living room. We're in here rather than the sanctuary because last year we had a, a, a dramatic water, city water main broke and sent hundreds of thousands of gallons of water into the sanctuary, into a lower level. Uh, so we're relegated to the living room for a period of time while that's uh, repaired. We'll get back there uh, in a few months, but I think it's a gift to be here because there's an intimacy to the setting, the music making, um, and uh, hopefully at home you're feeling uh, similarly. Uh, we uh, gather, as we have here at St. Peter's since the 1960s, for Jazz Vespers. Vespers, we know what jazz is, right? Uh, Vespers is a service that the church has said really as sunsets. It comes from an old Latin word uh, meaning evening star. And so even as the sun sets, uh, we gather by lighting a candle, uh, in a sense bringing that evening light into our midst. And at home, perhaps you'll light a candle too. And here, as we do, we say God's light shines, light everlasting. Could imagine that the psalmist wrote this psalm as evening fell. I don't know about you, but sometimes that's a moment to pause and to think back on my day. And of course, the words of Psalm 141 are filled with language about night. The psalmist sits sort of like a diary and writes, let my prayer rise before you, O God, as incense. And you think about the way incense rises up and the psalmist evokes that image, the sort of lifting up of my hands as that evening incense rises. The church has burned, the temple has burned, the cultures all over the world burn incense to welcome people into their midst. And the psalmist does the very same thing. It's an act of extraordinary hospitality. And then the psalmist says, as this evening incense rises, O Lord, I call out to you. Come into my midst and come quickly. Hear my voice when I call to you. One wonders what the psalmist was going through. Was it a rough day? Had they gotten to some altercation that they needed to say, to call out to the Lord? must be because the psalmist then goes on and says, set a watch, runs through the parts of the body, sets a watch before my mouth, guard the door of my lips, let not my heart even get caught up in anything that might be evil. Let me not be preoccupied. Let me not be weighted down with those who would do ill against me. Sounds like a good thing to pray the close of the day. And as the psalmist sits there and reflects on the way in which they could do good, the psalmist continues and writes, For my eyes are turned to you, O Lord. In you I take refuge. Give me always your life. All from that prayer, rising up as though it were incense lifting up of our hands, even as night comes. 
Let the incense of our repentant prayer ascend before you, O God. And let your loving kindness descend upon us, that with hearts open to others, we might sing your praises here on earth and with the whole host of heaven, and may glorify your name forever and ever. Amen.
This is a reading from the Gospel according to John. Jesus said to Nicodemus, No one has ascended into heaven except the one who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish but have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him.
reading from St. John's Gospel is perhaps one of the most memorable uh, pieces of all Scripture. It's interesting because in so many ways it's used positively and in so many ways it's used negatively in our society. Uh, in a way, you could say, oh, it, this sums up the entirety of the gospel. It's good news. It says uh, there's nothing you can do to earn a relationship with God. It comes freely to us. It's totally unmerited. It's grace upon grace upon grace upon grace. You see people that hold it up at placards, you know, at football games. But so too is it get held up at uh, places and by people. The school that I went to was one of the schools that the Westboro Baptist Church loved to come and protest against because of so many of us who were LGBTQ or those of us who are allies, and they would just stand there. And one of the cards that they always hold up was John 3.16. And so here's this thing that is uh, proclamator, pro proclaims the gospel, and at the, yet at the same time can be turned into a weapon that divides people. My preaching professor, the late Dr. David Bartlett, uh, was as much a professor as he was a pastor. He spent his entire life teaching, and every Sunday he was also in a pulpit somewhere uh, and at church meetings on Tuesday nights and Wednesday nights too. Uh, when he was teaching, we like to say that David was preaching, and when David was preaching in the pulpit, he was always teaching. He was an extraordinary human being. And one of the things he constantly said to us, whether we're writing a paper or if we're writing a sermon, was that you can't just simply deal with the text that's in front of you. John 3.16. Uh, there's a wider story there. It begins with somewhat a uh, story that gets lost uh, with Nicodemus. We don't even hear anything about him uh, tonight. We just say, Jesus says to Nicodemus. Well, who was Nicodemus? Nicodemus was a Pharisee, which is to say he was both a scholar and he was a religious leader. And he was curious about Jesus. He comes to Jesus in the night, uh, which in John's gospel is an interesting thing. Nighttime is a time of uncertainty. It's a time of not knowing exactly what's what. For Nicodemus, a time of curiosity. And he came to Jesus, and they have this uh, wonderful conversation about being born. And in Greek, it's a bit of a wordplay on being born again or born from above. But what they're really probing is a question about lineage. And Nicodemus, a good Pharisee, wants to know, well, this lineage that Jesus is preaching about, what about Nicodemus' own lineage? Is there anything wrong with that? It's an interesting uh, kind of conversation. In a way, it's the heart of a conversation that's ongoing in John's Gospel. But this is curious because you get into this conversation between Nicodemus and Jesus, and before you know it, Jesus is talking about light and dark, and he's talking about people who do good things, people who do evil things, and then suddenly Jesus is in the Judean countryside and Nicodemus is nowhere to be found. It's one of these conversations that begins, you don't know quite when it ends. You're not certain if anybody won it, you just know that they had a conversation. And yet, this gets turned so often when preachers preach about it, to this idea that somehow Nicodemus, a leader of the Jewish people, just couldn't accept Jesus. And before you know it, you're down this long uh, trope by a lot of preachers that becomes anti-Jewish. And yet, it's so far removed from the reality of that text. In John's Gospel, uh, the characters that come in and out of the Gospel, uh, they, don't, um, they don't really return, except Nicodemus. He comes back twice. Uh, the next time we see Nicodemus, Jesus uh, has gotten into a debate with the Pharisees in the temple. And the temple police come storming in, and a gigantic crowd rises up. And Nicodemus essentially saves Jesus' life. He intervenes and says, hold on a second. Uh, this guy is from Bethlehem, from the city of David. Remember that conversation about lineage and being born? He said, he's one of us. And as one of us, don't we extend to one another a kind of fair hearing? And then the tension is dispelled. The next time we hear about Nicodemus, it's not anything related to birth. It has everything to do with death. Jesus has been crucified on the cross, has died. And the disciples go to the local Roman authorities. They were in charge of everything. 
Um, and they ask a certain Pontius Pilate, uh, could we at least have his body? That was an extraordinary thing in the time. And uh, they do, in fact, give the body of Jesus over to a Joseph of Arimathea, who's said to be a secret disciple. And then, yeah, our guy, Nicodemus. And so for all those preachers who talk about Nicodemus, who somehow can't accept this promise of Jesus and lives his life in darkness, that night of Jesus' death, in fact, it's night, here's the interesting thing. He comes bearing 100 pounds of myrrh to anoint Jesus' dead body. Has anybody seen 100 pounds of myrrh? I was once in a liturgy where the liturgist wanted to make a point, and she ordered 100 pounds of myrrh. The, uh, you know, the, the storekeeper said, are you certain you want 100 pounds of myrrh? It is a gigantic amount of material. Just the mat, Nicodemus, if Nicodemus wanted to go to the, to the cross uh, and not be seen, uh, he chose to bring a hundred pounds of myrrh. All of this, this whole Nicodemus episode, if you think about him broadly and in the context of the whole of the Gospel of John, how in the world could anyone turn the promise that God so loved the world to give his only son and so as to give eternal life into something divisive. Quite the opposite. Nicodemus is an example of this eternal life that Jesus proclaims. Now, it is true that the church has long proclaimed eternal life the other side of the grave. But John's perspective is that that type of life doesn't simply wait for one's death. That's something we live here and now. And Nicodemus is a great example of that. In the midst of an uncertain time, in the midst of arguments, in the midst of, 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 of death itself, Nicodemus steps in with a way of light and love and mercy and life. Isn't that kind of the way life is? We look, we might have something incredibly wonderful happen to us and just one telephone call changes all of that. Or maybe perhaps we're in the midst of a very dark time in our life and someone reaches out. Today, we read this scripture uh, because it's, we celebrate Holy Cross Day. Um, Holy Cross Day is really the 14th of September. We find it so important that we transfer it to the nearest Sunday. It has its roots in uh, the Emperor Constantine's mother traveling to uh, Jerusalem on a pilgrimage, and she finds there a piece of the Holy Cross. And it becomes something that is very important in the life of the early church. It even defines when we celebrate the Feast of Transfiguration, 40 days before, there's so many things that are 40 days long in the church's liturgical year. But it's an odd thing. We're here in September. Uh, we're well beyond the events of Holy Week. We're on this side of Easter. We're on this side of Pentecost. We talk about the Holy Spirit and being in our midst and always building up new life. And for a moment, we're asked to trace ourselves back to Good Friday and that day in which Jesus was crucified and Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea and those disciples go to the cross and carry Jesus' body to the tomb. Sort of the way life works. And Jesus says in the midst of that that death never has the final word, that the ways of evil never have the final word. And Quite the opposite. Those of us who are living eternal life right now bring in the midst of those times that generous way that Nicodemus dealt with Jesus might bring to someone in need a word of healing, might bring in a very tense situation a word of mercy. 
That's what the church proclaims with Holy Cross Day. That's what the church really kind of proclaims every time it gathers on a Sunday, which is the day we say that resurrection triumphs over death. Today, you might not know this, we're gathering also in prayer in memory of Marcus's father, the first anniversary of his death. And what a gift it is to be together in community. For in the midst of, of death, we can hold one another in a, in a, in a way that transcends even, even death. Perhaps you're thinking of your own loved ones. And they come into our hearts and they come into our minds and they live with God and they live with us. One of my favorite hymns says of those saints who have gone before us, those saints who have lived this way of Nicodemus, this, these saints who have lived this way of eternal life in this life and then also enjoy it the other side of the grave. One of my favorite hymns puts the truth of the gift of eternal life this way, that we know in strife, life more sure. So tonight, remembering your father, remembering our beloved, thinking about this world of ours that is so readily divided. We turn to the cross where we find not simply life, but this promise of eternal life that we get to live now, live in mercy and love toward one another. And we do what the faithful have done across time and space. And we open our hearts, we open our minds first in prayer, knowing that God hears our prayers, but that we hear one another's prayers, and we act on those prayers too. And so join me now in prayer for the church, the city, the world, for persons in any need, for our beloved dead. Those of you gathered at home, you join your voices as well with ours, knowing that however we pray this night, God hears us. We pray for the church for its bishops, its pastors, its deacons, for all the baptized, for chaplains, for missionaries, for those who serve in specialized settings. Guide us all in the way of the cross and lead us in paths of faithful service. We pray for the world, for oceans and lakes and rivers and wetlands for trees and mountains, parks and wildlife refuges. Restore places damaged by fire or flood, windstorm or earthquake. Turn all our hearts toward the conservation of this, our fragile home. For the leaders of nations, Bring an end to warfare. Teach us how to live in peace with one another. Lift up those who are under oppression. Watch over those who flee their homes in search of safety and freedom. Particularly uh, this night, we pray for the leaders of nations who will gather this week to begin the 77th General Assembly of the United Nations. for those in need, for those yearning for meaning, for purpose, for those who lack stable employment or safe housing, for those who grieve, for those who are ill. Heal their wounds, bind them up. Open us and our hearts to provide for their needs. For our beloved dead, those we name now aloud or in our hearts, particularly Alfonso.
we remember them with thanksgiving as they are led by Mary, Mother of God and all the saints. So too, bring us with them to that feast which has no beginning and no ending.
Hello, hello. Hi, my name is James Boudreau. I'm the uh, communications director here at St. Peter's Church. And um, I just wanted to say a few words of thanks, and then I'm going to turn the microphone over to him so we can talk a little bit about the uh, songs for a, a minute, maybe, or um, and introduce the other musicians. But please do help me uh, thank Marcos Varela. And, uh, and thank you for being here in person. Thanks for joining us online. Um, next week, uh, we'll be back with uh, Andrew Hartman Trio, so I hope you can come back again. But um, to discuss some of this music, which is, uh, was specially sort of designed tonight, uh, let me turn this over to Marcos. Thank you all for coming. Uh, the first selection you heard was by the great George Cables. That was his Looking for the Light, um, a piece that I, um, I got from him and I've just really enjoyed playing over the years. It has a very uplifting feel to it and I just thought it would be perfect for the occasion. The next song we did was Lawns by the great Carla Blay. And then we did a piece by a wonderful singer I know from Cape Verde, or I don't know personally, but I love her music and my dad was a huge fan. Uh, that was Sodage by Cesare Rivora. And then the last piece we just did was one I wrote for my dad. That was Colinas de Santa Maria. And uh, we have Jay Sawyer on the drums. Wonderful Jay Sawyer. The amazing Adam Birnbaum piano. And uh, we're going to conclude with one of my earliest originals I wrote that still people seem to enjoy. This is called Where the Wild Things Are. Thank you. 
As you go forth from this place, go with the blessing of the one who brings light and life to all creation. And especially, go in peace. Thanks be to God.